Okay, this is third video in the sequence about information and economics or as a critique of the Hayekian school. The whole thing is based on a video on an article that Alan and I wrote in the 90s. So I covered the philosophical objections to Hayek earlier. Now I'm going to get on to the mathematical argument about why he's wrong. I'm going to introduce information metrics and I'm going to apply them to prove that market communication is either less efficient than or no more efficient than socialist planning, contrary to the claims of Hayek. One of Hayek's most fundamental arguments is that the efficient functioning of an economy involves making use of a great deal of distributed information, what he calls tacit information, and that the task of centralising this is practically impossible. In this video I try and put this argument to a quantitative test. I'm going to examine the communications costs implicit in a market system and a planned system and examine how the respective costs grow as a function of the scale of the economy. And the communications cost is a measure of the work done to centralise or disseminate economic information. And I'm going to use the conceptual apparatus of information theory to measure this cost. So let's look at some definitions. What's information? In the last video, I explained that information wasn't something subjective. It's something that exists prior to and independent of human understanding. In this section, I give two scientific definitions of information. The first is from Shannon, and the second is a later extension of it by Chaitin, which is also based on the work of Kolmogorov. Shannon came up with information theory in a practical context. And practice is central to learning. Why? Because it poses us real problems to solve. Think back to the stuff I've done on Kantorovich. He came up with linear optimization in a very practical context when working for the Soviet plywood industry and working for the locomotive industry. Shannon likewise was doing something practical. He was working for Bell and wanted to measure the capacity of multi-channel long distance telephone lines. For that he needed an objective measure of information. Philosophical speculation was going to be useless. And he proposed to measure it in bits, which is very familiar with us now. But he originated the idea. And what's a bit? Well, we think of it as a one or a zero. But he gave a more precise definition of that. A bit is the amount of information required to decide between two equally probable outcomes. You need one bit of information per time cost to know if it's a head or a tail, for example. And for multiple outcomes, he showed that information grows logarithmically with the number of equally probable outcomes n. So that the information content are, is equal to log to the base 2 of n, if there are n possible outcomes to choose between. And in general, where the outcomes aren't equally probable, he shows you, you modify this by multiplying the sum terms of the possible ones you can get by the probabilities and you take the log of the probabilities. Um, the difference between this, this formula all being positive and this formula having a negative in it is because the probabilities will be less than one and therefore the, negative, the log, logs will be negative and you have to put the negative term in, the minus one in there to get the, in, ensure you have a positive quantity of information. Uh, Greg Chaitin then extended Shannon's definition and he extended it using co computability theory. There's lots of interesting stuff in Chaitin, but for the purposes of the argument I'm going to develop later, I only need two definitions. Firstly, that the information of a structure is given by the number of bits in the shortest computer program which reproduces that structure. And the conditional information of a structure x given structure y, written as i x given y, 
is the number of bits in the shortest program which if you gave it y would output x. Now I'm going to apply these definitions and we'll apply them to the def dynamics of capitalist and socialist economies and see which whether one or other has a greater economy of information. Our strategy is first to consider the dynamic problem of how fast and with what communications overhead uh, an economy can either converge on equilibrium or in the socialist case follow a plan. I'll demonstrate that this can be done faster and with no less communications cost with a plan system. Now what's the demonstration? I'm going to use very computer science-y ways of denoting this, but let's say an economy is a, a quadruple for, made up of a technology matrix A, um, a final consumption vector pattern of final consumption C, and an exogenously given wage rate and compatible profit rate. This is for a capitalist economy. You wouldn't have a, a profit rate in a socialist economy. And Straffer, in his critique of orthodox bourgeois economics, shows that there exists an equilibrium involving a commodity flow matrix U and a P, a price vector, given those prior conditions. The flow matrix is different from the technology matrix because it involves actually applying weights to how much each individual technology will be used by. And I'm being charitable to orthodox economics in assuming such an equilibrium is reachable. And if you look at my other videos, we demonstrate that capitalism is unable to actually reach such an equilibrium. And I'm also going to assume, as is the case in all real commercial arithmetic, that quantities are expressed to finite precision. You express prices to a finite number of pounds and pennies dollars and cents, euros and cents. So we then have to say how much information is required to specify such an equilibrium point. And let's assume that we've got some efficient binary encoding mechanism which allows us to express a number of bits in the information structure S and S could be the whole economy. And let ec be the economy in equilibrium then its information will be i ec, and it can be specified by the information content of the whole description of the economy plus the information content of a program which will solve the Israfian equations. So you can't just say that the information content is given by the specification of the economy, you also have to specify a program that will solve it. Remember, Big E was our description of the whole, was a structure of the whole economy. And in general, we're going to have the information structure at the equilibrium is a bit, will be less than or equal to this, since we don't know whether um, our program is the shortest possible program. So I'm just going to say that it's specified by these, rather than saying it's exactly equal to. Now what do we mean on, about the economy converging on equilibrium in information terms? So let's look at that at distances in information space. The conditional information associated with any arbitrary configuration of the economy, where k is an arbitrary configuration of the economy with a flow structure and a price structure. And this can be expressed relative to the equilibrium state as where E is the equilibrium state as the information, the relative information of K relative to the equilibrium. And U is our notation for flows and P is our note, PK is our notation for the prices in this configuration. Suppose the economy is near equilibrium. We, in that case, the information content of K given E 
will be less than the information content of K because the equilibrium position tells us something about where we are. We're close to, 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 to E. For instance, suppose we can derive UK from the technology mat matrix and an intensity vector which expresses the rate at which any industry operates in Leontief style, then we're going to have the information content of the economy at state K relative to equilibrium is going to be less than the information content of the flow vector, the information content of the plus the information content of the price vector at point K and less than the price vector at, sorry, PU is, is not a price vector, PU is the program to compute it. Since U is a matrix and UK, little UK is a vector, we can assume that this is much greater than that. Now, as the economy nears equilibrium, the conditional information required to specify it shrinks. And it's this information which has to be transmitted ar around economic agents in order to get it to equilibrium. Now, how do we know it shrinks? Well, the intensity vector K starts to approximate the intensity vector UK starts to approximate the intensity vector UE. And that means you only need to a difference vector between the two to specify it. And in general, a difference vector requires less information to encode if the two vectors are close to one another. And the same applies to the price vector. So the condition information at time t plus 1 is going to be less than the conditional information before that. So the information, the conditional information declines with time as the economy moves towards equilibrium. And information has to be exchanged between the agents to bring this about. Remember, K was our notation for a whole economic configuration. And we're going to model the actual transmission of information between the producers and a market economy in order to move it towards equilibrium. And I'm going to outline the rules by which our model capitalist economy operates. It's a toy capitalist economy. And the way I do this has been very influenced by the way Ian Wright sets out his simulation models of capitalist economies, ones which he was able to derive the necessary um, if arising of the law of value as an, uh, an imminent effect of capitalist relations. Let's consider the rules that are applied by each firm. Each firm starts out ha at some guess of a selling price for its product and carries out the following procedures. It writes to all of its suppliers asking them for their current price. It replies to all requests for prices saying what its current price is. It then opens and reads all the price quotes from its suppliers. It estimates its current per unit cost of production. It calculates its anticipated profitability of production. And if the anticipated profitability is above the average rate of profit, it increases its target production rate by some fraction. And if the profitability rate is below, a proportionate reduction is made. It then calculates how much of each input J is required to meet that output and it sends off to its suppliers an order for that amount of their product. It then opens all the orders that it's been sent, totals them up. If the total is available than the greater is greater than the available product, it scales each order proportionately to ensure that what it can supply is fairly distributed among its customers. It dispatches the possibly partially filled orders to its customers, and if it has no remaining stocks, it increases its selling price. Later on, it receives all deliveries of inputs and determines the scale 
at which it can actually proceed with production for the next period and it then commences production for the next period. Now this is the kind of simplified assumption that uh, economists make that things go in a sequence. Things are produced, sold, bought, next cycle of production. That obviously is an oversimplification because sales and, and production are going on each day but just to simplify analysis people assume it is cyclical like that. Now if we assume that each iteration decreases the mean error of an economic variable by some factor g and g is between 0 and 1 what you get is a negative exponential pattern. Suppose that the the prices are converging on a uh, an ideal price which would occur in, in equilibrium, what we want to see is this kind of convergence towards equilibrium. We don't want it to see it jumping all over the place. So I'm taking the most charitable view of how the market operates, that it actually does converge towards equilibrium. And that's a negative exponential convergence. If you express that in bits, how many bits would you need to express the difference in price between the selling price and the equilibrium price? You find that the error in bits falls linearly, whereas the error in money falls negative exponentially, the error in bits falls linearly. And this will apply to the whole economy. The error in bits of every economic variable if you added up all the bits required to encode the error in bits of all the different economic variables, under such a convergence condition, it would decline linearly. The convergence time and in information space for some small adjustment will approximate to a linear function, which we can write, at, I will write as the change in information, delta for the change in information given. Um, the information, the relative information of k compared to equilibrium. And we're now in a position to express the communications costs of reducing the conditional entropy of the economy to some level. Communications takes place in the previous thing in steps 1, 2, 8 and 9c of the procedure. We want to see how many messages does each supplier have to send and how much information must these messages themselves contain. Hayek says the market serves as a telecom system. Well, that's not true at all. The market always depends on some underlying communication system. In the 19th century, it depended on people sending letters. By the time he was writing, in the 30s, it depended on telex machines. So that's why he speaks of the market as a telecommunication system. But he has it the wrong way around. The market is supported by a telecommunication system. It doesn't function as a telecommunication system. And nowadays you'd have email. All of these are relatively redundant information systems. And I'm going to assume, on the contrary, everything is efficiently compressed to the minimum in order to look at the number of bits that would be required. And we've had four types of messages. Requests for quotes, quotations, orders and dispatch notes. Well, we can distinguish them by four symbols. R, Q, O and N as the leading symbols of the message. Now, a request for quote would have to be sent to a supplier and, and I'm assuming each supplier only makes one good at the moment to simplify it. And if you're asking a quote you have to give your home address, say your home email address or your home phone number or home internet address. Uh, if you're asking for a quotation you can you say it, a queue for a quote um, sorry, not asking for giving a quotation, you, you, you say, this is a quote, this is the price I sell at, and I'm supplier S, so you know who it's come from. If you're doing it, wanting an order, say, 
say it's an order um, this is the quantity I want I've write, written it to UIJ to indicate it's a, a cell of the economy's flow matrix and H is the person who's requesting the order so they know who to deliver it to and a dispatch note is similar so those are the four types of messages and each of those is encoded in a minimal form and if each of n firms has m suppliers the total number of messages of each type during an iteration is going to be nm given that we've got an alphabet of four message types these symbols can be encoded in two bits each uh, Shannon's encoding theorem there actually you can do it with slightly less because let's see no you can't they're they're, they're all just a, they all occur with equal frequency and we're going to assume that all these other th fields not the header fields are representing some kind of binary number let's assume they represent in 32-bit binary numbers so a message like QPS will require two bits of header and two B bits of, of data for PNS. Now let's look at the planned economy and how the firms in a socialist economy work. Here there are two distinct procedures. There's the procedures of the state-owned firms and the procedures of the planning bureau. So we're looking at the state-owned firms the firms all send to the planners a message listing their address, their technical input coefficients and their current stocks. They receive instructions from the planners about how much of each of their output is be sent to each of their users. They send the goods with dispatch notes to their users. They receive goods inward, read the dispatch notes and calculate their new production level and they commence production. So in many ways similar to what the capitalist firms do except they're not concerned with prices they're not looking for quotes they then repeatedly perform the same sequence replacing this step with one that uh, gives the planners a message about their current output stops now what do the planners do and this is the GOS plan building they read the stocks and technical coefficients from all firms and then use the kind of maths I've discovered in previous um, videos to compute an equilibrium point E from the technical coefficients and final demand. They then compute an optimal plan from the current output to E which comes in in the stuff I covered on time series planning. They instruct the firms to make deliveries consistent with that plan. In the second and subsequent periods, they just monitor what's going on. They read messages given the extent to which output targets have been met. They compute a modified path from the current output to the equilibrium and instruct firms to make deliveries consistent with that path. And again, there's a very similar set of messages. Uh, you have a message art requesting stock info sorry a message not requesting a, a, a message saying what the stock is of a given supplier we have um, the technical coefficients we have the orders and the dispatch notes are the same the number of orders and dispatch notes between iterations is going to be invariant between the two modes of production in the planned case the orders come from the center Whereas in the market case they come from the customers but the same orders have to be made the difference is that in the plan system there's no exchange of price information instead in the first iteration there's transmission of information about stocks and technical coefficients the stocks make up a small amount of the information so let's ignore that for the moment each socialist firm will on average send m coefficient messages of the form technical coefficient cell ij set uh, the value of cell ij 
and something to say this is position i this is position j and position i and position j can be thought of as um, product codes for example each private firm previously would have sent out m requests for quotes and m quotations qps if you add these up you've got h p and s as actual numbers that have to be sent let's ignore the the little two bit headers here you have ai sorry a aij i and j again three numbers if we ignore the header bits the amount of information required is to be transmitted is the same in both cases socialist and capitalist economies have the same minimum information transmission requirements there is no economy produced by the market no economy in information transmission so why are there differences between capitalist and socialist economies Hayek was wrong to claim there was any information efficiency for the market exactly the same amount of tacit information has to be converted into explicitly transmitted information in both cases but so far I've been ridiculously charitable towards capitalism I've pre pretended that it can actually converge on an optimum the way right-wing economists claim but we know in fact that doesn't happen we know that that is a myth put out by the economists instead of a smooth convergence on an optimum when Hayek was putting forward these arguments in the 1930s look what was happening to the US economy shooting right up to vast levels of unemployment 25 percent unemployment and this is going from 1929 there to 1942 it doesn't fall until war breaks out and the state starts to take control of the economy so no the whole case for social and capitalism having the same information flows was based on a ridiculously charitable assumption about capitalism that actually does converge on the equilibrium what we actually see was what at the time Hayek was writing at the time he was writing the facts proved him wrong there were vast recessions in the capitalist world socialist economy the Soviet Union was growing exponentially so what's our conclusion it's relatively easy to refute Hayek's claim that there's any information economy associated with the market and capitalism even the most ideal capitalist economy one making the most charitable assumptions towards capitalism requires just as much information to be transferred as a planned one but we know that an unplanned economy is subject to recessions slumps and mass unemployment that don't affect planned economies